Hello, my name is Robert Morgan, and I'm a game writer and a narrative designer, whatever that is. This is chapter three of a series of talks on game stories, how they work, why they often don't work, and what it is about them that lets us talk about them in a useful, constructive way, rather than constantly referring back to game stories that we've played in the past, which might be increasingly difficult to get hold of. This is because it's all about trying to put names to some of the things we see in game stories all the time, because I studied literature at university, and literature outfits you with this technical palette of terms. Luckily, I'm not really supposed to remember what all of these mean anymore, but at the time I was supposed to remember what they all mean. They might be technically quite confusing and boring and usually some sort of ungodly mix of Greek and Latin, but what they do is give you a technical palette for talking about what's happening in a game rather than constantly having to refer back to things like, for example, when you say, oh yeah, this is right, this is just like that moment in that Samuel Beckett play where it draws attention to the ultimate futility of literature, except insofar as it's able to draw attention to the ultimate futility of life, which Samuel Beckett play, fucking all of them. <laughs> Now, we have some of these terms in games. If, you know, if you've ever looked at TV tropes, then you'll know these are usually more about what happens in games than about how they work. So they're of limited utility in allowing us to maintain a collective memory of how it is that game stories work and hopefully improve on how game stories work. And this is partly because, as I said last month, games are actually an exceptionally referential medium even though ideally we shouldn't have to rely on reference in order to be able to talk about them. There's so many shibboleths that are involved in being able to talk about games in the first place. There's so much of game culture which is dependent on the idea that you need to be able to have access to trivia in order to prove that you're a real gamer. In the sense of dramatic irony, and we talked about in session one, in the sense of the audience's knowledge or meta-knowledge of elements outside the story, outside the closed world of the game, so much of this stuff is actually often essential to the function of the game. Any given link, for example, is ostensibly ignorant of the existence of any other links, and yet the game as such doesn't fully make sense or you're not getting the most out of it if you don't know about the other games, if you know, don't know about the other games in the series. Now, I don't want to get too far into this idea that games, or gaming culture at least, is kind of overly dependent on large amounts of required knowledge, or that this is off-putting. I mean, that's definitely the case, but it's also an inevitably self-limiting phenomenon, because there are gamers for whom this is the first and most definitive Lara Croft, for whom this is the only XCOM and for whom this is the definition of Star Wars. Oh no, wait, yeah, this is the definition of Star Wars. And that's great, because we can argue the toss over which of one of these is most authentic and whether this is a good or bad thing, but it's also kind of irrelevant, because this is happening. Culture has this real hunger for reference, for reboots, and it's mean, it means that we're constantly kind of desperately referring towards some authentic original work, while also constantly overwriting it. Unless, of course, you're an X-Man fan, like I am, whose cinematic timeline is so muddled and plays so fast and loose with its own reboots and sub-boots and intra-boots that any given instalment can be watched in any order and it makes about as much sense as anything else. Uh, what? Oh, nothing. I joke a lot about how the hashtag is the dominant medium of our times, but really the dominant medium of our times is context because it's considered a risk factor to create a new media property if it doesn't already have some kind of name recognition, whether that's a studio name or the title of the property or being a sequel, or at least being able to be compared to other games or properties if we can't describe it in terms of other games or films or something that it's like. And it's also considered a major win for a movie, for example, if it manages to satisfy our need for referentiality, and somehow it still makes sense to newcomers, i.e. people who are watching the film without any prior knowledge of whatever canon it is it's referring to. Now, I'm not, this isn't intended to just gripe about this phenomenon, because really, this has been happening as long as art has been being made. This is Jérôme Executant le Gladiateur, which the, the actual gladiators, the guys fighting, was one sculpture made by the, the painter Jerome. It was the first, yeah, great. It was his first stab at being a sculptor, which kind of, fuck you, basically. <laughs> but then, 
he passed away before he finished it, and his son came along and incorporated the fighting sculpture into a sculpture of his own father finishing the sculpture. It's a piece of self-referential context, and the thing was based on a painting that the guy had made years and years ago. The idea that things are overlapping blossoms of self-referentiality is actually nothing new, and it's not something that's worth spending a lot of time griping about. But, <laughs> you can take these things too fucking far. It's happening. It's really interesting. And as long as you weren't born yesterday, then you get the full benefit of these movies and these games congratulating you on your meta-knowledge. If you were born yesterday, then I guess you get the shitty end of the sandwich. Because culture isn't really for you anymore. Not until you've read enough Wikipedia to catch up. But oh well, humans catch up fairly quickly. And besides, babies can't use steam. So, in the words of Bo Burnham, fuck them, who needs them? <laughs> and fuck you too, Howard. <laughs> But this means that going into almost any game is an exercise in its interplay between the game's desire to immerse you in its storytelling on its own terms, and the game almost certainly relying on some level of meta-knowledge on your part. And this can be seen in all sorts of ways. For example, in games which aren't really designed to be played by people who haven't played the other games in their heritage, and which have a story which, in the words of my brother, makes perfect sense as long as you've read The Silmarillion. <laughs> Fuck you, Dave! <laughs> but it also means that immersing yourself in the story, losing yourself in the story, enjoying the story, it's a lot more complicated than it looks at first glance. And that's why this month I want to talk about willing suspension of disbelief. To give it its full name, willing suspension of disbelief. So this was coined by the poet Coleridge in 1817. <laughs> To explain why he included fantastical tales, tales that involve fairies and spirits and the supernatural, in a collection of poems that he put together with Wordsworth. Now, fantastical elements and fairies and all this stuff had kind of gone out of fashion with the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. And Coleridge basically justified including these elements, supernatural elements, by saying that a human interest and a semblance of truth would be the key thing in readers not worrying too much about the improbable or the impossible elements, and instead settling in to enjoy a good story. That you could induce a willing suspension of disbelief, provided that the story seemed human and true enough, whether it was improbable or not stopped mattering. Now, it has to be said that Coleridge remarking that it was because of a decline in the belief in fairies that caused these things to fall out of fashion, kind of has to be taken with a pinch of salt, because I don't think there's a lot of mileage in saying that pre-Enlightenment people enjoyed stories about witches and goblins purely because they thought they were true. And hell, because Shakespeare, who lived well before the Enlightenment, knew exactly what was going on with the idea of willing suspension of disbelief. And he knew that fiction is this kind of strange mutual understanding between author and audience to accept what is being put in front of you. Shakespeare didn't necessarily believe in fairies to write them into his stories. He just knew a good literary device when he saw one, or she. In fact, it's actually often theater that the term, this term suspension of disbelief gets attached to most. Because when it comes to books or films, we don't tend to expend a lot of energy worrying about how all of the black marks on the white page can seem to be the voice of a beloved character. We don't tend to worry all that often about why it is that we can see the actions that a film character is performing and why we can see them when we're not present in the scene. But something about theatre, about the level of unreality about theatre, the fact that we can see the strings. The strings are just obvious enough that we have to give ourselves up to accept the temporary reality of what we're seeing. We have to willingly suspend our disbelief. That's because theatre, more than perhaps any other form of fiction, is a covenant. It's a pact with the audience, because we can see the strings, but hopefully, after a certain point, we stop caring. Or at least that's the theory. And maybe that's because theatre is inherently participatory, and it's designed that way. Because with a book or a film, you can get up and walk away, and it's no skin off the creator's nose. They're probably not aware that you stopped reading the book halfway through, and they probably already got your money anyway. But theatre was originally competing with its audience. I always think it's kind of a shame when today theatre is portrayed as something that you have to dress up for and go and sit in a dark room, and it's assumed that you'll pay attention in silence and take it very, very seriously, because God knows it didn't start out like that. And maybe that's why, in many ways, theatre led 
the development of sophisticated techniques to build this willing suspension of disbelief. Because if it didn't maintain the audience's willing participation in the fantasy, then the audience would let you know about it by throwing vegetables. So what kind of techniques was it that theatre developed to maintain suspension of disbelief? Let's look at Chekhov's gun, for example. Probably everybody's familiar with Chekhov's gun. It's a rule of thumb for holding the audience's interest and for rewarding them for entering into this suspension of disbelief and not pissing them off so they end up throwing vegetables. The idea is, if you introduce a gun, if you even feature a gun, even if you don't mention it, if it's present on stage, if it's there in Act 1, it had better be fired by the end of Act 3 because otherwise you're making a promise to the audience and you're then not fulfilling it. And it's important in theatre because theatres are packed with the audience. In order to hold their interest and reward their interest, you have to make good on your promises. But I also think it's a good example of how this whole thing works completely differently in video games. Because in video games, if we see a special looking gun in Act 1, we're going to want to fire it ourselves. If we hear about an important person, we're going to want to meet them ourselves. And as is often observed, if we get shown a giant mountain, we're probably going to want to climb it ourselves. I talked about Journey a little bit last month in terms of how it experiments with objectives, because it doesn't give us objectives in the conventional sense. But because we're experienced game players, we are shown a beautiful mountain, and on, generally speaking, our natural assumption will be that that is where we're supposed to go. There are no other salient features. And so the game naturally introduces an objective in a way that feels really aspirational to us. It's all we get, it's all we're given, but because we're game players, this is usually enough. Our inclusion or our interaction or our partial ownership of what happens, the fact that it's interactive, makes it enough. Because we understand that a decently designed game isn't going to offer us the possibility of something really interesting to do and then deny it to us right at the last minute. At least not without a really good reason. But what does this do to willing suspension of disbelief? Because games are full of elements which kind of float somewhere between reality and unreality. They float somewhere between fiction and us as audience. There's menus, there's pause buttons, there's UIs. Some games expend a lot of energy on making sense of as many elements of kind of meta-fiction as possible. And some do away with those elements altogether. And some don't worry about us seeing the strings, about us seeing the score, about us inexplicably being able to telepathically tell how many bullets are left in our clip or how many med kits we have. Or they don't worry too much about the fact that we apparently have a rucksack full of 16 automatic rifles. <laughs> One thing that is for sure, for all that we talk about realism in games, the actual quality of a game in terms of review scores has very little to do with how visible or invisible the strings are. And maybe this has something to do with how most games are, to one extent or another, objective-driven. Because we have a sense of purpose when we play a game, the extent to which it needs to lie to us is diminished. In some way, we understand that we have a role, and we have an independent desire to fulfill that role, whether that's to win, or to explore, or to build. So any kind of break in the fiction, any moment that something which would otherwise screw with our sense of suspended belief or screw with our sense of the plausibility of what's happening in front of us. We don't mind as long as it expands our ability to fulfill our objective, like how we can pause the game, which is the ultimate in unreality, but it helps us so that we can, you know, go and make a sandwich or not interrupt a boss or do something that allows us to optimize our performance in the game. We don't tend to mind that in terms of it's theoretical unreality. It's not very real, but who cares? So are we even talking about willing suspension of disbelief anymore? Is that even a relevant thing to be talking about in terms of video games? Well, some people really care about suspending disbelief. Right now, billions of dollars are being spent to create this strand of gaming that, so we're told, is about removing all the elements of unreality between us and the simulation. Now, however you feel about VR, does this mean that we're coming to the end of the need for willing suspension of disbelief? Are there going to be no more strings to spot? Is that the point of VR? Well, personally, I don't think so. 
I think, I think about it a lot because I work in VR in some of my day jobs and what I keep ending up saying to people is that suspension of disbelief isn't going anywhere. And not just because VR is a really imperfect and quite expensive business. It is, but it's not just that. There's also the element of self, who you are in VR, who you are in the simulation, who you're embodying and role-playing is just as, if not more important than what you see in terms of your experience of VR. For me, VR is most interesting for its capacity to put us into other people's perspectives, not for its capacity to show us something completely new and spectacular. Which is why I think one of the good things about the rise of VR is that it will give rise to a new kind of protagonist, for example, who we're interested in role-playing, rather than someone who's supposed to be an invisible cipher like most of the brown hairs who make up most of game protagonists. Because it's easier to role-play someone interesting than not, in a similar way to how VR is actually providing a space for thoughtful, slow-paced, contemplative games. Much to everybody's surprise, everybody who expected VR to kind of, myself included, to be this sort of ghetto of extremely hardcore experiences and deathmatch, finding that deathmatch really doesn't work in VR in the way we expected because the physics are nauseating and it's kind of overstimulating and it's weird to be shot at. <laughs> We're finding that actually it turns out to be fertile ground for the type of, you know, for lack of a better term, walking simulator that's actually experiencing a real growth right now. And I think that's really cool. But it's most importantly, this is all because immersion is hard to build and easy to break. And immersion can be broken either because you spot a glitch or there's a physics error, or you see a texture pop, or all of the things that we're striving to eliminate in order to create virtual reality in order to create something that is theoretically supposed to trick us into thinking we are somewhere else. But immersion can also be broken because you lose interest in being the person that you're supposed to be in the simulation because their actions don't make sense. We don't care about their motivations. And all this means that good storytelling, protagonists that are sympathetic, not necessarily likable, but sympathetic, all of this stuff isn't just a narrative design issue anymore, it's an immersion issue. And once immersion is broken for whatever reason, whether it's graphical or storytelling, that's when you remember that you're sitting alone in your living room wearing a plastic helmet. <laughs> so suspension of disbelief isn't going anywhere because getting your audience invested in your story and staying immersed, interested in staying immersed, is the best way to keep them on your side. Getting the audience to lose interest in spotting the strings is a hell of a lot easier and a lot cheaper than trying to hide the strings in the first place. And it results in better storytelling anyway. Side note, theatre isn't going anywhere either, because actually, theatre is a reference that I continually use when I'm talking about VR to professionals. Games are still, in my opinion, much too conceptually beholden to cinema. So people in VR talk about how in VR you have the lack of a cutscene because you can't take control of the camera away from the player because it causes nausea. And so suddenly we can't deliver story in the same neat, discrete chunks separate from the gameplay that we kind of always have been. People talk about the lack of a cutscene as though it's a tool that we've lost when really it's a compromise we don't have to make anymore. Oh no, how do we tell stories when the user can be looking anywhere at any moment instead of looking at what we want them to or we can make them look at exactly where they're supposed to be looking? Hmm, if only we had a legacy of an art form that had solved all of these problems before. <laughs> if only we had some fucking masterpieces of a couple of different art forms that could teach us how to design for a world in which you can't completely control the player's imagination. Uh, where you can't control the cuts or where you can't control the camera, all of this stuff. Instead, you just have to get the audience paying attention where you want them to. Because it's interesting, because you can control what is the most interesting thing that's happening. But ultimately, you can't impinge on the player's desire or their freedom to look wherever they want to look. Hence the pun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If only we had some examples of working with an audience's imagination instead of impinging on it. Yes, we are all Hamilton trash now. <laughs> so what does all this mean? We talk so little about suspension of disbelief, but we talk so much about realism, and so selectively about realism. Right, because like, people taking hundreds of bullets to the face is the least realistic aspect of the division. That's the thing that I find <laughs> most offensive when I'm walking around New York, collecting apparently infinite amounts of ammo from identical 
polystyrene boxes that have been left there by some kindly nuclear Santa. <laughs> Spotting the strings is the game community's favourite pastime. Whether it's bragging about insider knowledge of why a game sucks because your uncle works at Nintendo, or whether it's identifying places where a game could have been better, this is what we apparently spend all our time doing. But really, the only consistent demand for realism seems to be where realism is a shorthand for better graphics, or where a supposed lack of realism is preventing us from doing what we want or feeling as cool as we want. Whereas unrealism, which makes us feel cool, or streamlines our experience, is absolutely fine. And this is because in games we're not spectators on a contrived event that's being created in front of us, as much as we are active participants in a mutual fantasy. So yes, willing suspension of disbelief is a literary term that probably isn't as useful in games as it is in lots of other media. Because it was a function that was required to keep audiences in their seats, or to keep people from dismissing a story just because it had fairies and magic in it. And that clearly isn't an issue for gamers. Instead, what we tend to find people doing is a kind of suspension of self, a suspension of critical dubiousness. And yet at the same time, games ask us to think critically all the time because you have to treat a puzzle as real at some level before you're able to solve it. You have to expect physics to respond in a consistent way before you're able to solve a puzzle in the first place. There's something about believability and immersion that means that I think we still have a lot to learn from suspension of disbelief and how it works in other media, even though in games it's more like a push and pull, it's more like a negotiation of disbelief that we enter into when we sit down and start a game up. And we'll accept different levels of disbelievability at different times. There's no neat, rounded answer to this one. It's something that we're still going to have to work out in our relationship with games. And luckily, in the meantime, it's, people are still going to keep making good games. Because it's not like people didn't understand how fiction worked or what audiences liked up until Coleridge talked about suspension of disbelief. People had known how this stuff works on instinct for years and years. And remember, Coleridge only started talking about suspension of dis disbelief to justify why he wanted to write stories about goblins and spirits in the first place. If people got hung up on that these days, there'd barely be any media at all, let alone any kind of head cannons. A multimedia, multi-franchise properties that thrive on the endless meta-debate and speculation of their audiences, they simply wouldn't exist. And what a tragedy that would be. Suspension of disbelief is just another way of talking about how we enjoy games. Because the fourth wall these days is really just another canvas. And luckily there are plenty of other ways of making people enjoy your fiction without making them worry too much about realism, such as making people feel clever for getting a joke that no one else got. <laughs> so, until we work out more about how people relate to games, I guess we're just going to have to suspend judgment? <laughs> oh, come on. You knew it was coming. And I knew you knew it was coming. And why? Because if you show your audience a gun at the start, one way or the other, you better fire it by the end. <laughs> That's where I want to leave it. Thank you very much. <laughs>